Thank you, everybody. Great to see you guys here, and I actually feel honored to be invited by Chris here. When I was a little boy, um, my parents, they're Africans. Africans have high hopes for their children. My parents wanted me, as mo most Africans, uh, my dad wanted me to become an accountant because he thought accountants made a lot of money. And I think we find that he's actually absolutely right. My mom wanted me to be a doctor because doctors are revered, you know, and, and respected members of the community. So you can imagine when I told my parents I wanted to be an artist, what a letdown um, that was. Because <laughs> my, my father isn't alive right now, and I wish he was. Because when I did tell him I was going to become an artist, um, he did not like it at all. And until he died, that became the source of the break between both of us. Little did he know of what we'll be able to achieve. This is my brother and I, my, bro my brother who is an award-winning um, film director. Um, little, little did he know of what we could have achieved. Um, my, mom, my mom is still alive and she's quite proud of what we, we've been able to achieve. One of the things I want to talk about, when people talk about comic books and, um, and art, people think that we're illustrators. We're not illustrators, we're not drawers, we're actually storytellers. That's essentially what we do. If you ask me, what is comic book art, or what is comic art? A definition from Will Eisner, I don't know if any of you know Will Eisner, he used to write The Spirit back in the 50s. He's probably a genius, one of the greatest comic book artists that ever lived. He defined comic book art as sequential art. That is to have panels, of illustration or of art in sequence. Another artist, an academic, called Scott McCloud, gave it a more academic uh, definition, which would be a sequence of pictorial or other images in deliberate sequence. Of course, I, um, I decided I was gonna simplify it because I come from advertising. That's the first thing I did when I graduated from art school. And so we have a different understanding of illustration. I think it's a more accurate one. It's succinct, actually. I call it sequential illustration. What that means is everything on a page is an illustration because it, it depicts an idea or a concept. Not only does it depict an idea or a concept, it depicts time. So you can slow down time or you can quicken time. That is the definition of illustration, to illustrate. So my definition of comic book art is sequential illustration. This book here by Bill Sinkovich, and those of you who are comic book fans probably know him. He used to do Daredevil back in the 70s. He was a pretty much standard artist back then. He's become something else. This book called Stray Toasters is probably, in my opinion, the best graphic novel ever created. And the reason why I say this is the best graphic novel ever created was he created techniques in storytelling that are unparalleled. In fact, I have never seen them since 1987. This book was done in 1987. I have never seen the techniques in storytelling replicated. And his ability to tell stories wasn't merely in how a scene is composed, is in how everything tells you something. Every single element, the boxes, the panels, the square, the colors that are used, the positions, everything, including media. So you might be using wash one minute, pastel the other. Everything has a meaning and serviced story. We've never seen anything like that since. Of course, some of you are very familiar with the new Batman uh, movies. But each and every one of those new Batman movies were inspired by comic book artists who redefined how you tell stories. This is a book for life sort of event, isn't it? So I am going to very quickly go through some very important books. Akira. Anybody knows Akira? Manga. Akira with... Ghost in the Shell, I actually have Ghost in the Shell there. Not for the timid, it is quite strong, and children should not be reading Ghost in the Shell. 
But those two books are seminal. They capture the Japanese spirit and mind in a way that no library or collection of books in prose could ever do. One of my lecturers once said, this is back at London School of Theology, and he says, don't tell anyone I said this. So please keep this a secret. He said, there is more theological knowledge and understanding in C.S. Lewis's The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe than in all of the books in the library. And we're talking of tens and thousands of books. Back then, I didn't understand what he was talking about. It would take me several years to begin to understand the role of story, how story in itself can be so expansive in the way human beings understand each other. <laughs> Another book I will show you. Now, this is not a comic book, but it's story. Isaac Asimov, anyone knows Isaac Asimov? Probably a genius. Um, you guys can tell how old I am now. <laughs> his foundation trilogy, so it's foundation, foundation, and empire, and second foundation, masterpieces. My ministry is called Kingdom versus Empire. I thought I coined that term and the concept of Kingdom versus Empire. Empire being Satan's kingdom and kingdom being that of the kingdom of God has come. I got that idea from this book, from Foundation and Empire. Foundation being the kingdom and empire being that which is evil. When Paul talks about the peace of Christ, he just, he's actually cleverly doing it in a way where those who are in the know know and those who are not won't know. So when he says the peace of Christ be with you, what he's actually saying is the peace of Christ as opposed to the peace of Rome. So he juxtaposes the peace of Christ versus the peace of Rome. The peace of Rome is a facade, it's a lie. The peace of Christ is truth. And so, let's uh, talk about storytelling when we use visuals, like I say. People tend to think that when we draw, when we do comic books, we're just merely drawing. But it's actually a heck of a lot more than that. So we're, we're going to take a test case. And test case will come from the Manga Bible. It's the book of Jonah. Now, it's not quite like this in the book. And for some reason, I don't quite know why. But in my scamps, this is how I have it. In the book, it's called Jonah. But in my scamps, this is how I have it. Can anybody figure out why I've done that? In my book, in my scamps, it's called Jonah's Tale with the learner sign as the L. As a serious reason, it's funny, but at the same time, it's serious. As far as I'm concerned, the story of Jonah is a comedy farce. That's the genre. That's how I understand Jonah. I don't understand Jonah from a moralist point of view, which is God is trying to say something about how you have mercy for others. I don't understand it from that point of view. I'm not saying that isn't important. It is. But my understanding, first position on Jonah, is that it's a comedy farce. Now, once I have settled my mind that this is comedy, it changes my entire approach. So the first three panels in Jonah is this. Now, we all remember how Jonah opens, do we? Jonah opens with God speaking to him and giving him a command. So I have three drawings. And they're all identical. In the first drawing, God calls on to Jonah and he's happy. In the second drawing, God calls onto Jonah and now instructs him, go to Nineveh. And I don't know if you guys can see that. He's not happy about that. And he now thinks, ah, I've got an idea. I am going to run away from God. And so I have this comical, 
Are that comical, him running away from God? Now, remember what talk, when I talked about time, you can either slow down time when you're drawing comic books so you can make it quicker. By repeating this panel three times, literally just breaking it down, I have slowed down time. So that you can take your time in trying to understand what's going on here. There's a conflict here with Jonah, but I'm making fun of it. I'm not taking it seriously. And the reason why I'm not taking it seriously, I want you to read Jonah the way I am reading Jonah. I am reading Jonah as a comedy. I'm not reading it as a treatise. I'm not reading it as an essay. I'm reading it as comedy because I think the original listeners understood Jonah as comedy. Okay? So you have these first three moments that are quite funny, and then he runs away from God. Now, this is supposed to be really funny for those guys because if God is as high as the heights and he's as deep as the depths and he's as broad as infinity, how can you run away from God? So that bit is supposed to be funny, and all the listeners, the children would have been laughing when the narrator was kind of reciting this. So he runs in the opposite direction. So Nineveh is up there, and he runs west to Spain. And it's like, where, where are you running to? That's why I haven't run in that funny way. Now, of course, he gets onto a ship, and, on, and everyone's life is threatened. They're going to throw all this stuff aboard. And um, it's, he, 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 he recognizes that he's the one who's responsible, and he tells them. And so he's cast into the sea. And so what do I do with that? Now, remember, I am thinking of this as comedy. I am not thinking about this as some sort of Sunday school lesson. I'm thinking it's got to be funny. So, this is what I do. I remember what I said about breaking time down. So time runs slowly. You do that by using panels. Now, that is Jonah in the water. And this is Jonah again. He's still sinking and the big fish. And then you have the aftermath. The fish flying away. Can you guys see that? So Jonah's falling down. I break that panel. So you get, you get a sense of time. The fish approaches, gulps him up, and then floats away. I don't show you what he's doing, how he does it, because I leave that to your own imagination. But again, that is the comedy element right there. And I applied that so that, again, you're immersed in my own reading, not necessarily yours, although of, of course you'll have your reading, but I'm trying to get you involved in my reading. And then there's the last section. Of course he goes and he preaches, and this is done quite quickly. It's done quickly because he really doesn't want to do this. He just says, repent, yada, 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 and then that's it, and he walks away. He's hoping that they'll say no to God, and then they perish. So I have another set of panels at the end of this. Now, there's something about doing comedy. Why is it important that we read Jonah as comedy? I'll tell you the reason why it's important. Comedians have the ability and the license to talk about things that nobody else can talk about. Now, I don't know if you remember in the book of Luke, where Jesus talks about certain miracles that were done in Elijah and Elisha's time. And those who benefited from it were not Israelites. I don't even remember that. He was going to be thrown off a cliff for saying that. Now, if Jesus made a comedy out of it, they probably wouldn't have. And that's the thing about comedy. With comedy, you can pretty much say anything. Some of the most powerful social commentators are comedians. Comedians making fun out of 9-11. 7-7, seven, seven, but making poignant points while they do that. That's what makes comedy powerful. The book of Jonah is actually quite important in that sense 
Because the book of Jonah talks about power. It talks of one of the most evil uh, powers in the world. One of the most evil empires that ever existed on the planet. And now proposes that that planet, that, so not that planet, that, that power, that empire, that God has mercy on it. A mercy that's quite similar to the kind of mercy that God would show to a Jew, to a Hebrew. Okay. So, Jonah sits from afar and he watches, waiting for God to throw down fire, hailstone, and meteors on Nineveh most evil of cities. As, as he waits, God creates shade for him. Starts out there. Remember what, again what I said about time splicing? By doing it this way, I'm slowing down time so you can take some time with it. The tree blooms and then it perishes. And as it's perished, he gets really angry with God and God says, you are upset about that, but that's flesh and blood. Those, those are people that, and I care about them too. And as God makes him realize how his mercy isn't only reserved for those who have a covenant with him, it's also reserved for the whole of humanity, my camera closes on to Jonah. And for once in the entire story, it's no longer comedy. It's comedy right from the beginning, but in the very last panel, it's no longer comedy. Because now I'm now making my serious point. The thing about comedy is, it makes a fuss out of serious things. But the reason why it makes it farcical is so that it makes it approachable. Once you are able to encounter and approach that facile nature of this very grave issue, then it turns it on its head and says, I'm talking about you. That's how I understand Jonah. And by making Jonah a comedy farce, I was trying to introduce you into how to read Jonah the way I think Jonah was intended. Now you may ask me, how did you come to that conclusion that Jonah is a comedy farce? Well, there's so many reasons, so many angles. One of them is how he runs away from God. But one of the most telling aspects is where everyone in Nineveh repents, but then it goes on, even the animals repented, cow, sheep, a dog. And not only did they repent, they repented in ashes and sackcloth. And that's quite ridiculous. The intention, obviously, is that this is comedy. But they were handling a very grave theological sort of like issue. Remember one of the things I said about the evolution of theology in old Israel? how it continues to evolve. They would believe one thing in an era, and in the next era, they believe something else. Or all the time, the theology is growing and developing and changing. This is, one of the form, this is one of the aspects of Hebrew theology that was going through a change. You're looking at one of the most oppressive empires, Assyria, sacked the entire north. Eventually, it did sack the entire northern kingdom, decimated it. So you're looking at that kind of power not only sacked the entire northern kingdom, sacked several others. Several other kingdoms were decimated. While Egypt trembled in fear somewhere in the west, cowering away, not being able to do anything about this awesome power. And God is now telling the Hebrews that I also care for those guys. This for them was very difficult to understand. And the only way in which God could actually touch this most you know, grave you know, theological issue was to deal with it from the point of view of comedy. And that's why I have done Jonah using comedy. Like I said, comic book artists are not illustrators, we are storytellers. So when we receive a brief, we think about how do we engage our reader? How do we get them into the same room that we're in? How do we pace the story? If you look, for example, at my character, my character's looking a little bit towards the right. And the reason why he's doing that is because we read from left to right. 
So all the time I am guiding you, he looks that way, he looks that way, and he's running that way. All the time I'm always guiding you to go the way I want you to go. Now sometimes I may want to keep you in a place, in a page, and in a way close it. If I do that, I'll do that. See what I've done there. You go that way, that way, that way. And then as you get there, it comes the other way around. I'm closing you into my story. It's almost like it's a full stop. Lots of techniques artists use uh, and comic book writers use, which you will be totally unaware of. Like I said, regarding straight toasters, when I say every element on the page is used, that includes the gaps. Every gap there is something that leads you into doing what we want you to do. In some cases, we may even remove the gap there and do something like that. All the time, we're trying to get you to feel something, feel something that helps us to tell our story. That's how we draw black professionals. Thank you.